Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker and today I am so pleased to be interviewing Tammy Nelson. She is a board certified sexologist. She's an ASEX certified sex therapist and licensed professional counselor. She has a private practice for couples in the greater New York City area and she is the author of a book called The New Monogamy as well as some others, including getting the sex you want. But today we're going to be talking about infidelity. That's what the new monogamy is about, is redefining your relationships after infidelity. And so I just wanted to welcome you to the show, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, very excited to have you today. Is there anything else that you would like to add to your your introduction or tell us a little bit more about you? Uh, No, I mean, that really is what my focus of my private practices. I I love to see couples and I do a lot of intensives for couples where they come for a day. I do couples retreats and workshops. And and although I do see individuals, um, I'm a sex therapist and a certified sex therapist. So I really focus on two areas, either neglect from long-term committed partnerships where they kind of work on their companionship and they want to come to me to work on their erotic relationship or I work with couples where there's been a trauma in their erotic relationship like an affair or some kind of betrayal. Okay so why don't we just start right there I mean how would you define Mm -hmm. infidelity it's kind of an interesting thing to define these days. Yeah I think because we have such a broad network, let's say, of possibilities and potential and opportunity for infidelity, the the whole uh, opportunity for defining infidelity, I think, has changed and has become a point of contention among couples. So I believe that there's a whole monogamy continuum. In other words, there's a whole way to define monogamy all the way from having fantasies about someone other than your partner to um, people who are in open marriages and go out for coffee with someone without telling their partner. Um, so I really define an affair as having three parts. One, that there's some kind of outside relationship that's outside of the defined agreement. You know, outside of the relationship could mean that you're having an emotional affair with someone at work. I call that like your cube mate or your work spouse. Or it could be someone online that you're hanging out with, you know, a Facebook friend or someone from the past. Or it could be a um, someone that you're having a webcam relationship with or someone that you're flirting with on your phone. That's any kind of relationship outside of your marriage or your partnership. And then the second part is some kind of sexual relationship. So for some people, that might be like a a parallel marriage, you know, a a long-term affair that's been going on as almost as long as the marriage where you have a sexual partner that's been a secret. Sometimes people have kids with these other people, you know, you always hear these stories about someone who's had a a hidden family in another state. And that is actually much more common than you might imagine. Or it could be that you have a mutual masturbation situation with someone else, or it could be pornography, or it could be um, a sex worker, or there's some kind of sex going on. Or the third part of an affair is the dishonesty. And we know that for many people, it's the dishonesty that is the most difficult to get over. And the dishonesty has a continuum too. So it could be, you know, that you've discovered it and your partner admits it right away, or it could be that your partner discloses it right away and says, I'm so sorry, we should go to therapy. This is terrible. Or it could be that You've discovered it and your partner denies it. And that is really, for many people, the most painful and probably the most difficult to work through. But there's one more area where 
you learn about it in dribs and drabs and it comes in little pieces. And sometimes that's really a way for your partner to protect you from the truth. And there's a difference really in protecting your partner from the truth of your infidelity because you don't want them to be hurt. And when your partner looks you in the eye and asks you, have you been cheating on me? And you lie to them directly. So there's one thing to you know, avoid the conflict of, of telling the truth because you really do think it would be the best thing for your partner not to know versus lying to their face when they already know. So, so many complications in that third area of dishonesty. I'm sure we could talk about that for hours. Sure. And, and so are you saying that all three of those components need to be present for your definition of infidelity? They usually are. I mean, for an affair or any kind of infidelity, there usually are those three areas, some kind of outside relationship, some kind of sexual injury, and some kind of uh, dishonesty. Because, you know, usually people don't cheat with someone who cleans their house better, right? It's usually some kind of erotic injury of some kind. Right. And just by the nature of that, it implies that there's some kind of relationship. And then the dishonesty comes with the territory, right? It, I mean, by its nature, affairs are about lying and about dishonesty. So usually all three things are going on, but sometimes it's one more than the other. And sometimes it's one of those areas that really is the most hurtful for the person who's been betrayed. So let's talk a little bit about the betrayal part uh, before we get into the whys and what do we do now. So because usually that that's the biggest piece in that moment of crisis of understanding what's happened and the trust is gone and the feelings are all over the place. And it's just a very, very vulnerable and negative space for the person who's been betrayed to be in. So could you talk a little bit about what that's like for people, how they describe that, what they can do in those moments to self-care and to keep maybe their wits about them as they try to negotiate what that's going to mean for them? Well, we certainly all know what that's like. If it hasn't happened to us, it's happened to someone we know or to our parents or we've certainly seen it in the movies or we can certainly imagine it in our you know worst imagination. So I think everyone knows what that feeling is on some level. Um, you know, it's a fear if it's not a reality for many people. But I think that there is several phases that people go through if they've been cheated on. And certainly the crisis phase, when you first find out, when it's first discovered or when it's first disclosed, is the most disruptive. So when someone first finds out about their partner's affair, the uh, disruption is really almost like the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. And that's the existential crisis that people go through. Like, I thought I was the most important person to you, and I guess I'm not so unique. You know, if you're not exclusive with me, then I can't be the most unique person to you. And that's really the promise that we make when we, you know, get married or make a, a committed partnership is that I'm going to be the, the most important person to you. And so that crisis that we go into is not just, oh, my God, you lied to me, but, oh, my God, if I'm not the most important person to you, then... I I don't, have, I don't have that place in the universe anymore. So the crisis phase is really sort of a, uh, like you've just been in a plane crash. You have to lick your wounds and withdraw a little bit. And it's almost a, it's very emotionally volatile. So that's, it's a time to take care of your kids, figure out who's sleeping where, uh, make sure you eat. You know, it's a death. It's a grieving time. And it's not like you're grieving your partner. But it, it's a time of grieving the vision that you had of your marriage. Like, I thought it was one way, but it's actually something totally different. And that's, that's the painful part that people go through. So you, you have to give yourself that time of reevaluating and, and uh, looking at things from a totally different perspective. And I, I suggest to people that you don't make any decisions during this time. Because remember, you just got hit by a car or a truck or a train, depending on how bad it is. 
and that you put off making any long-term decisions until you get to the next phases of recovery. Yeah, and, and it's often too in this time where in decisions such as maybe telling certain people that maybe later you regret telling or maybe even asking questions of your partner, like wanting to know a lot of details. So do you want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of, of the types of disclosures and the types of communications you want to have with others and how you want to maybe go about that carefully? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point that you're making about telling people because once you tell someone, they, you know, you're going to tell people that you know will align with you. And once they align with you and against the other person, if you decide to stay together, they can't take that back. So, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, loyalty among our family and friends. And they're, they're hopefully going to tell you, oh, that's a terrible thing they did. And you should leave that person. And I can't believe they hurt you like that. That's what you want to hear during those times. That's why you're telling them. But the problem with that is if you decide to stay, then it's going to be very difficult for you to turn to them for support if you decide to stay. And they're going to feel betrayed like, hey, I told you to leave. How come you didn't leave? I can't believe you're staying. And it's an awkward situation at the time um, because you're confused and they're confused too, particularly if they love the other person as well. If it's your parents or their parents or close friends, they're going to feel betrayed and confused. And um, you're kind of putting them in that awkward situation. Not that you shouldn't use your friends and your family for support. You're going to need a lot of of support. But the other question that you asked was, you know, should you ask a lot of questions? And most people have a lot of questions. Most people become like detectives. Detectives and they want to know every single detail because the feeling is if I ask every single question that I have and if I find out every single detail, then I won't feel so left out. Because when people find out that they have been cheated on, they feel like, wait a minute, I don't even know you. Like, how could you have had this whole other life without me, this whole other secret self that I don't even know? Like, I'm not even a part of it. And so part of wanting to know the details is wanting to be part of the experience. The downside of that is two things. One, once you have that picture in your head, you can't ever get rid of it. So you have to be really sure when you ask those questions, do you really want to know the answers? Because you have to live with them forever. And two, are those really the answers that you're looking for? Because a lot of times people ask detective questions looking for details when really they're not looking for answers like, you know, how many times did you sleep with her? Or, you know, did you sleep with him in a hotel? Or, you know, how big were her boobs? You know, they don't really want to know the answer to that so much as the underlying bigger question that they're looking for the answer to. Because most people underneath those detective questions are really looking for the answer to the bigger question. And the bigger question is usually why. You know, not what or how often or who, but why. Like, why did you do this to me? Why did this happen? You know, why is our marriage at this place? And usually people can't answer that question. It's kind of like asking a kid, like, why did you eat that cookie? It's almost dinner time. You know, kids are like, I I don't know, I wanted it. can't answer that well and to your point some of the answers we want are difficult to ask directly you know so am I not good in bed are you not attracted to me anymore do you like that body better than my body those are I think a lot of times what's under those questions like you're saying and then also the, the fact that if you get some of those answers and you have those visuals in your head they tend to play like a movie where it's a lot more, it looks a lot better in a movie than it was in reality. <laughs> right. And so it can be hard to deal with those types of images that you don't even really have accuracy to. Right. And to be to be fair, I mean, most of us don't remember every single detail of everything we've done. So, you know, when you're asking your partner to remember, well, six months ago, what did you do and how many times did you sleep with them and what... Sometimes people say, I don't know, and that's not acceptable, of course. And so it becomes, you know, one of these, we'll answer this and answer this and answer this. And sometimes it feels like resistance and it feels passive aggressive when people say, I don't know the answer. But sometimes we really don't know the answer. 
So the idea is to become an investigator instead of a detective. And what I mean by that is to, um, when you're moving out of the crisis phase into the insight phase, the insight phase comes when you start to ask questions like, how did this happen to us? What was going on in our relationship that we had gotten to this place? You know, what is the story of this affair? What's the meaning of this? You know, what does this mean about me? What does this mean about you? And what does this mean about us? You know, in my book, I talk about how people start to dialogue about the meaning, the story that they make up about what this means about our relationship. And that's when you know people are in the the second phase of recovery. And that's when they start saying, you know, this isn't your affair. This was our affair. This happened to us. And, and I don't mean that by blaming the victim. I mean, you know, I know one person cheats, but you are both sort of in the car accident. You're both in the car. Maybe one person was driving, but the, the car wreck, you know, influenced both of you. Yeah, and this can be a really challenging phase to get into, especially if you're the wounded one. And it's really at the heart of what most of us are doing in couples counseling around infidelity is this type of work that you're describing. But it can be difficult to shift into that because it really does require both partners to take accountability for the relationship. And the last thing sometimes a wounded person wants to do is to do exactly that. I want to just be upset and mad and blame you. And those are very natural feelings. But really to do the type of work that needs to be done to really help save marriage is that dual work that you're talking about. So any any tips about how to get yourself there if you're in that position or just maybe validating the difficulty of getting into that position? Well, I think, you know, it's really hard to move from the crisis phase to the insight phase because you keep getting triggered and going back to the crisis phase. So I have a couple who I just saw who, you know, they were really doing great work on on trying to find empathy for each other. So the goal is not forgiveness, because forgiveness is very much about power. So he had the affair, and he says to her, I'm really sorry, which frankly is only skin deep. It really doesn't mean anything. And so she is sort of supposed to say, okay, I forgive you. But if she says, I forgive you, then what does she have? She has nothing. He had the affair. Now he has the forgiveness. And she, on the days when she feels like she has no power, she's going to take back that forgiveness and say, you know what? I don't forgive you today. Because otherwise she has nothing to balance out the relationship on the days that she feels like he gets everything he wants. And so many times people hold on to that feeling of, you know, I can't let it go because Otherwise, it feels like, okay, well, if I forgive you and move on, then it's almost like you've got away with something. It means you don't care about my feelings. It's almost like, you know, I don't matter to you. I'm worthless. You could get away with it. So holding, I'm just supposed to be okay with this. Right, exactly. So holding on to those feelings is a way to have power and a reminder, like, don't take me for granted. So in order to move into that next phase, there has to be empathy both ways. And that has to go deeper than just, oh, I'm sorry, I know I hurt you. That for forgiveness and asking for forgiveness, and that's not enough. It's not the same as empathy. Empathy is being able to say, it makes total sense that you feel this way. I totally get that I hurt you in this way. And for the person that was hurt to say, you know, I don't forgive you, and I wouldn't have done it, but I kind of get why you did it. And that's totally different. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. No, and I'm really glad you're bringing up this point because from the Mormon perspective, there is this pressure to forgive. You know, we're always in religious settings being told to be forgiving and to forgive mm -hmm. uh, the people we love. And so there's this pressure almost like to be a good spouse, I need to be forgiving, which adds another layer of complexity because then there's this guilt and, and discomfort with, oh, now on top of it, I need to be upset that I'm not forgiving. Yeah, I think that's very useful is that this isn't so much about measuring some type of forgiveness stick, which I think is very hard to do anyway. How do we ever know when we really check off the forgiveness box and instead build more of this empathic stance towards one another? 
I think forgiveness comes in time. It grows really organically when you can really empathetically understand where your partner's coming from. Then you naturally let it go. But until you can be empathetic with what happened, there's no way you can find forgiveness. So the goal is not forgiveness, it's empathy. And it's also erotic recovery. Because remember, this is like an erotic injury. So until you work on your erotic life together, you really can't let it go. You can't forgive. Because there's too much pain in that area. So you might be able to live together as roommates, (laughs) you know, and nod and smile at each other and take the dog for walks. But you can't really move forward into the third phase, which is the vision phase. I mean, there's just no way. Yeah, and it's interesting. As I've worked with lots of couples, I find that some people really take a sexual break, you know, like I need to not be sexual with you for several weeks or even months. Mm -hmm. Um, And I need that type of boundary. And that's, that's a perfectly appropriate thing to do. But I also find that there are others that feel guilty because it rekindles the the energy or the passion. There's something that they don't find like they understand about that. And they're wanting to have sex all the time. Mm -hmm. And I hear it from the wounded partner in my rewarding bad behavior because I'm having sex with her or with him. And I just Mm -hmm. think that's an interesting, you know, I kind of take the stance that there's no one right way and that all these ways are valid. But what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's much more common than people think. Um, A lot, a lot of couples, especially in the first phase, in that crisis phase, have really hot sex and sometimes better sex than they've ever had. And there's several reasons for that. One is purely biological and it comes from the animal kingdom, what we call mate guarding. And mate guarding is this biological sense that somebody else wants you and they can't have you and I'm going to reclaim you. And it's this almost this urge to, you know, have sex all over you so no one else can have you. And it's um, a very ownership-like feeling. And it's so primitive that it makes sex really boil down to a primal bond between you. Because we do have a, a very primitive need to to bond with another person. And there is a bond at your core because you were together in the first place. It does sort of reunite you in that way. But I also think that there's something else that happens where, you know, we long for someone in the space in between us. Attraction happens in that distance. You know, when it's sitting next to you on the couch every night, not so much. You know, we become more like family and you're not so sexually attracted to your family. You're not supposed to be. So when suddenly your partner becomes somewhat of a stranger to you and you're looking at them with this new curiosity saying, I'm not not sure I even know who you are. And what did this other person see in you? Suddenly a new longing, a new attraction happens, even at the same time when you hate them and you want to kill them and you want to kick them out of bed. You also feel this intense hence attraction and longing for them. And it's very confusing. People come into my office and they're hiding their head in shame going, oh my God, we've had so much sex. And I just don't want him to think that that means I forgive him. Because I don't. So we're having the same experiences, yes. (laughs) Yeah, it's very, very common. And many times it wears off, you know, when people are in the second phase and they're really working hard on on their relationship, a lot of times it does wear off and it changes as people, you know, try to heal. Um, but it's exciting because it also means, look, sometimes an affair is a way to wake up the relationship. Sometimes it means their relationship was going nowhere and perhaps was at its edge of ending. And this may be, you know, the reboot that it needed. People don't want to look at it that way because it's so painful. And who wants to think, oh, our our relationship needed this affair? That's uh, so counterintuitive. Right. It's almost like it's not something you'd ever recommend. Uh, I think like Esther Perel says, it's like cancer. You'd never recommend getting cancer. But people who survive cancer will often say, boy, it really changed my life in ways I wouldn't have anticipated. I wouldn't even put it in the cancer category. I, I would maybe put it in the, you know, it's like a separation from each other. When you go through a, a super long separation, you know, many times it's not that we take our partner for granted. It's that we stop being curious about our partner. We think we know everything about them. 
You know, we put them in a box and we say, oh, she would never be into that. He doesn't like this at all. He would never cheat on me. She totally doesn't like that kind of sex. You know, I know everything about them. I could finish her sentences. Well, you know, once you get into that, then there's no more attraction. We fall in love with someone who's curious about us, who asks us questions about us, who wants to know about us. And so, you know, the longer we're together, unfortunately, the less curious we are. We decide we, decide we know our partner because it makes us feel safe. You know, we don't want to know there's any wild cards there. <laughs> we want to know that, you know, nothing, nothing surprising is going to happen. But then when something surprising does happen, it's incredibly exciting because it makes us curious. It makes us ask questions. It brings up conversations that we never would have had. And suddenly we're talking about things like, okay, what do you like in bed? And what should we do with our relationship? And where are we going to live? And are we going to stay together? And, you know, who who do you really you know, want to be with? And are you attracted to me? And, you know, what should we do in order to make this work? Conversations that obviously had to happen, but never would have up until then. Yeah, that kind of that the tension between the needs of stability, which we all want, but also novelty and adventure and passion. So those are constantly in tension with one another. Yeah. And how nice if you can figure out how to do those without having to cheat on each other. Now you can figure out ways to you know, create a new monogamy, which is really what the third phase of recovery is about, is that's when you decide, do we want to stay together? And if so, can we create a new relationship? Because frankly, and I say this to people, it's so hard when I first look at them in the eye and say, you know what, to be honest, I think your marriage is over. Because once you violate that monogamy agreement, you knew you were stepping out, you knew what you were doing, you knew that you had this agreement that you were going to be sexually monogamous and you broke it. And so the marriage agreement that you made is over. However, you can have a new marriage with the same person going forward. You just can't go back. Because once you try to have the old marriage, you keep trying to push it back. You keep trying to create what was. You keep trying to you know, go back to when you were first married. It is never going to happen. And if you try to have the old marriage, you're going to end up here anyway. So you have to draw a line in the sand, grieve it, say, well, this was, this was not how I thought it was going to end up. I didn't want to turn out this way. We didn't say we we're going to get married and end up cheating on each other. And you sort of draw a line in the sand, complete this marriage, and then decide about the new marriage going forward. You know, we can have many lifetimes, many marriages within the lifetime of our marriage. One before the kids are born, when the kids are born, when the kids get older, when the kids move home. Trust me, I've had a lot of them already, and they're <laughs> and they're moving home. It's frightening. But, but you know, the the idea that you could start fresh with a whole new monogamy agreement. Let's get into that because I yeah. think that's a fat. I mean, that's why I loved the title of your book. It just caught my eye. I mean, what do you mean by the title, the new monogamy? And and maybe before we even get into that, what types of messages have most of us received about what monogamy should look like, and where are we all starting off from? Well, I think everyone makes an explicit monogamy agreement when they get married. In other words, they tell each other, you know, I promise to love, honor you, and. You know, they don't say, I promise to love, honor you, and never have a Facebook friend. We don't share explicitly our implicit assumptions about what monogamy is. We just assume that both of us agree. And we assume that, you know, whether you think you should masturbate, you shouldn't masturbate, you think you should have Facebook friends, you shouldn't, you think you should tell your girlfriends all the secrets about your marriage, you think it's okay to talk to your ex it's not okay. Whatever you think your partner thinks, uh, you may or may not be right. And the conversations about those kind of things actually need to happen quite often because as we change and grow, we're different people at different phases of our lives and we want different things. And so just like you have to get your marriage, your, your driver's license renewed, you have to get your marriage license like updated too with new conversations all the time about what's important to you. And it might be things like, you know, um, I, I don't want to go to your parents anymore for the holidays. 
really simple, explicit conversations about how your marriage is changing. Or it could be like, it's not fair that you don't want to have sex anymore. Part of my implicit assumption was that we were going to have sex on a regular basis. And you haven't wanted to have sex for a year. That's not okay. And what do we do about that? And how do we make changes? And how do I help you? And what do we, you know, what's our conversation going to look like around desire? And um, what's the meaning of this? And, you know, to have those explicit conversations is uh, the thing that will prevent affairs. And it will help you to move forward into the marriage that you want, not the marriage that your parents want for you or that your church wants or that community wants or that your grandparents had. You know, marriage is changing. We live longer than we've ever lived before. And we need to have a different kind of marriage. If we expect to have monogamy, if we expect to be hot for the same person for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years without cheating on them, we better have conversations about how to make that work. Because there's a lot of information out there about how to cheat, but there's not a lot of information out there about how to stay sexy for each other for that same amount of time. And so the only people that have that information is you and your partner. You have to figure that out together because I can tell you what I think is hot, but it's not going to be the same thing that you think. So the only person that has that, you know, sort of manual is you. And you, that manual is going to change, especially if you're a woman. It's going to change like every month. <laughs> so you, you have to check in and find out about that with your partner. You have to learn to have an open conversation. One of the things that I think happens a lot when people are having these types of conversations and putting things out on the table is then this pressure to comply. Well, if you desire that, then that means I have to do it for you. And and then these, you know, these places of resentment that can often come up. So how do we, in a sense, make space for people's desires and wants and wishes without it being uh, then, oh, yeah, you have to do this for them as their as their spouse? Mm -hmm. So it's very much in the same vein as the empathy for um, pain as it is around um, your vision of your life going forward. I really look at it as sexual empathy because most of what you're talking about is probably around sex and fantasies. So the idea is to develop um sexual empathy, not necessarily to take things into action. But if your partner's saying, you know, some of the things that I want to integrate into our new marriage going forward are ABC, the goal is not to say, okay, I guess I have to do those things. And the goal is not to say there's no way I'm ever doing those things. You know, what's wrong with you? But to say, you know, well, tell me more about what is intriguing about that for you. Let me understand what is hot about that for you. I want to find a place of empathy, sexual empathy, so that it makes sense to me what the turn on is for you. Because if I can be empathetic for you, then it's more likely, first of all, that we could take it into action. But if there's a turn on there that I can understand, it might be a turn on there for me, but I don't really... I don't really know what it is until I figure it out. So can I just give you a quick example of what I mean? Absolutely. I love examples. So like I have a couple who he, they were an older couple and they were recovering from some infidelity. And um, I had them talk about some of their sexual fantasies that they wanted to integrate into their sex lives that they were rebuilding. And they were an older couple. They were in their 60s. And he, which is you know, almost my age, but he said to her, he had a fantasy of buying a sex swing that he wanted to attach to the ceiling. And she said, are you kidding? There's no way that we're buying some swing and hanging it from our <laughs> ceiling. I am never, ever doing that. And so I said, well, instead of saying no way, never ever taking that into action. There's, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a spectrum here. You can be curious about something and wonder about it, or you can have fantasies about it and it can really turn you on, but you don't ever have to take it into action. You can just share 
something that's hot for you. Or the other end of the spectrum is the things that you actually both want to do. So right now he's just sharing like a fancy that he has of this sex swing that he saw online somewhere. And he's sharing with you like, oh, wow, I'd love to do this. And so let's see if we can get to a place of empathy. So ask him, you know, tell me more about what's hot about this for you. And so she asked him, you know, tell me more about what, what you think is hot about this sex swing. And he said, well, to be honest, what I think is really cool about the swing is that, you know, our whole lives, I have been overweight. Like he's a big, big guy. And he said, I have been trying for years, every time we make love, to not crush you. He said, I I hold myself up on my wrists and I'm on my knees and I'm trying desperately not to crush you with my big fat body. And he said, the thought that I could be on a swing means that I would feel weightless. And he said, I'm so turned on by the idea because my knees are killing me. And he said, and my, I have a real hard time with my elbows. I'm getting arthritis in my elbows and I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I'm going to hurt you when we make love. And I can't use all the positions that I think you would need. And I'm just really turned on by the thought of it. And she started crying. She said, you know, that makes sense to me that I could understand. That, and she mirrored him back because I make them mirror back. And she said, it makes sense to me that you would want to be on the sex swing because for years you've been afraid of crushing me um, because of your weight and that this would take all the pressure off your joints and you would feel weightless. And, you know, she said, I can totally empathize with that. And I know that you are very uncomfortable and I appreciate so much that you don't want to hurt me. And she said, I still don't want to get the swing. I'm afraid it's going to like pull our ceiling down and I don't want our friends or our children to see it. She said, but you know, I'm willing and it kind of is sexy for me to think about. I'm willing to do it in the pool. She said, and that, and that you could still be weightless. And she said, I've never wanted to do it outside. I was always a little nervous. She said, but now that I think about it, if that's why you want to do it, I'm kind of intrigued by that. And they kind of giggled and they made a plan and, you know, it was really sweet and sexy. And, and that's what I mean by empathy. Like if you're not turned on by it, or if you're really resistant to your partner's desires, you need to ask more about what turns up, turns you on about it just to get to a place of empathy. It doesn't mean you ever have to do it. A lot of times you can talk about fantasies forever, just get turned on by them and never do them. But to try to get to a place where you can at least empathize with what turns you on, turns your partner on about their desire. That's a wonderful example. So can you expand further? I know in the book you talked about uh, closed versus semi-open versus open monogamy. And I think you're kind of getting to this in the sense of opening up monogamy does not necessarily mean you have to do anything outside or with other people, although that's obviously a possibility. But the, there's a lot of things that could happen within the confines of your relationship that allow for even semi-open monogamy type of ideas. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole continuum of monogamy, which I think I was alluding to earlier. And, you know, on the sort of on the left hand side of if you picture a big continuum, I guess, is this idea of having fantasies about other people. You know, if that you find yourself fantasizing about someone else or coveting your neighbor's wife or some people have to come home and share that with their partner. They feel like, you know what, I've cheated in my heart. That was an old Jimmy Carter saying, but they have to come home and really share that. And for some people that's kind of hot actually coming home and talking about their fantasies for other people. It's like, if I shared every time I got turned on in the grocery store, I'd be, we'd be talking all the time. And for some people that feels hurtful. Like, why would I tell you that? That's crazy. And by the way, 98% of people have fantasies about someone beside their spouse. So it's super normal sure. to have that. Everyone except my husband, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and you're exactly right. This can feel very threatening, especially if monogamy is, is defined in this idea that uh, my spouse is going to meet every single one of my erotic and sexual needs and ideas and thoughts and everything, you know, which oftentimes... I think especially in Mormon marriages, we tend to kind of go that route that anything outside of the marriage is seen as very threatening or even sinful. 
And, and yet that's not really most of our realities. And so then we're stuck in this space of not knowing how to negotiate some of that or even talk about it because we're, we're kind of stuck in this space of feeling like I'm betraying you, even though it's just a thought or, or something that most people struggle with at some level or another. Right. And, you know, I mean, look, why should we all get all our needs met? There's, you know, there's a little bit of an entitlement here of like, well, because I want it, I should have it. Well, no, just because you want it, you shouldn't have it. You should suck it up and come home for dinner. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to watch the movie and you're going to sit quietly. Um, (laughs) But, you know, there's also the possibility for some couples that actually find joy in their partner's joy and that that are not threatened by taking into action some fantasies that might include other people. So even things like watching their partner masturbate, that for some couples might feel very, very threatening. And for other couples, it's like, well, there's a difference between secrecy and privacy. Do we tell each other every time we masturbate or is it okay? I know for some Mormon couples, masturbation isn't even off the table. It's not even an option. But for other couples, you know, watching pornography together is is a way to have an open marriage. It's a way to watch erotic films. There's a lot of feminist pornography now made by women for women for couples that couples can watch together to um, enhance some of their intimacy. For some people, that means they're in an open marriage because they can openly do that. For other couples that um, have negotiated even uh, a polyamorous relationship, it's not about the sex. They really believe they can love more than one person at a time and have relationships that are emotional and committed within their marriage. For other people, you know, they feel like they, what I call, have suburban monogamy where they on the surface, they appear very conservative, you know, the head of the PTA and, um, you know, they have important jobs and political jobs in the community and, and they appear totally monogamous, but they have somewhat open sexual behaviors, you know, on the weekends, they might have sex with their friends, but in all in the same room. And then they just go back to their lives during the week. And that to them is monogamous because it follows rules that they have negotiated. So as long as they have negotiated those rules and everyone is happy with the rules and no one meets for coffee without the other people or outside of that weekend, then it's all within their monogamy agreement. So Anything goes in their marriage as long as it's their marriage. I don't have really any judgment about what people want to do as long as they're not using the idea of, quote, an open marriage as an excuse for an affair. You know, an open marriage is not an excuse to continue a current affair. If somebody comes home and says, oh, let's have an open marriage, I've been seeing this person, I think you know, you should give me permission to continue that. That's not what an open marriage is. An open marriage, first and foremost, is an open dialogue about what people want. And it's really no one else's business what people do within the confines of their own monogamy, as long as it doesn't affect or hurt anyone else. And so my job is just not to help people decide what they want, but to help them have a conversation about everything so that everything becomes a talk aboutable thing in the vision of their relationship. I don't think it can work to open a relationship unless they have a very strong foundation of communication. And most people um, have a lot to work on when it comes to healing and communication. Um, Most of us have to learn to appreciate one another, to uh, be able to talk about our real feelings and our real desires and to learn how to empathize with each other and validate each other. You know, most of the time when we communicate, we're just waiting for the other person to stop talking so we can say what we want. That's really not communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Right. To really sit with the like you said before, the curiosity and the desires and the needs and the thoughts of your partner, regardless of whether or not they turn into action, but just to sit with that. 
information exactly. can be really powerful. Exactly, yeah. And just to plug your book, you have great questions in your book to help people kind of walk through these types of negotiations. Anything from as simple as, you know, I, I had a thought as I was in the grocery store versus, you know, I, I want to actually have sex with another person, right? There's a huge spectrum in between those two questions and um, lots of things for couples to explore. And this is a lot of the work I do with Mormon couples. I think Mormon couples often find it curious when I say to them, you know, it's interesting that I work with many people who are active and believing members who have negotiated all different kinds of things. You know, to your point, there are Mormon couples that aren't comfortable with masturbation, for example. There are Mormon couples that are totally comfortable with masturbation, solo masturbation, not knowing about each other's masturbation. Same goes with pornography or erotica use or fantasy play. There's probably not going to be as many believing active Mormons that are comfortable with maybe inviting another person into the equation, but even that is an interesting interplay because of our history, you know, with polygamy and such. And so it just, it is interesting, the conversations I have with many, many Mormon hmm. marriages. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating, actually, when you think about it, yeah. that we're actually even revisiting the conversation about polygamy when it used to be so, uh, such a, um, you know, a taboo topic. Now, because of polyamory and young people sort of having this concept of, you know, everyone living as a village, talking about polygamy with a different, a different lens, I think. It's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Well, so tell me a little bit about this uh, erotic recovery that you were talking about. I really like that language. And I think that's what you're kind of getting at as you're negotiating these things. You've dealt with the crisis. You've dealt with some empathy, you've dealt with some negotiations. Now we're really into a space of erotic recovery. And what do you mean by that? So erotic recovery really means that you have to take the recovery process after an affair or after any breach of your monogamy agreement all the way to erotic recovery. Otherwise, the other person is basically still in bed with you. I mean, you cannot just heal by saying, well, we're going to take, you know, our affair experience and we just won't talk about it anymore or we'll just live as companions and roommates and hope for the best or we'll just avoid the whole conflict and you know what's very common is for one partner to be angry that the other person keeps bringing it up um, a lot of that keeps coming up because you haven't created a new erotic life together you know there's your companionship which is your everyday roommate life where you know you decide what you're having for dinner and who's bringing the kids to school, you know, but the whole other part of your relationship is your erotic life. That's what makes you feel in love. You can love one another, but to feel in love, you need some kind of passion and aliveness in your relationship. And then and only then do you feel that connection and that alive love feeling, romantic love feeling. So erotic recovery means tiptoeing back in in a way that defines you as a, couple, a new, new romantic couple. And so there's a sort of delusion in our culture that, you know, you're only romantically hot for each other in the beginning of a marriage. Well, that's not true. You can create those feelings again by uh, revisiting your erotic life. And I, I recommend that people start by even if they've been having sex during that crisis phase, I, I sort of put a moratorium on them and say, you know, for the next six weeks or sometimes 12, but for the next six weeks, um, I would suggest no intercourse. And for everyone, I tell them they should have a sex date once a week. And a sex date does not mean you go out to dinner, no rich food, no wine, you just no movies. You're just going to fall asleep when you get home. No one has sex on those nights. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but you have a, a night that's just about creating a sacred space for your erotic recovery. And you set up the room, you light the candles, you create the space for your erotic life. And that becomes the sacredness of that erotic connection. You know, you hang up a sign, you know, do not disturb. And it's every Friday night at nine o'clock, regardless of what else is going on, what else, what else is on TV, whether you're mad at each other, whether you have a cold, whether you feel like it or not, you show up and you show up for each other. 
and for the first six weeks, you know, I you, I give them this um, six weeks to recovery uh, ebook, basically laying out the first week. One person gives the other person a massage, but doesn't touch any of the bikini areas. And the next week, the other person gives them a massage, and they switch. And you know, it basically leads up in safe touch to a more sexual and erotic experience. And the reason I do that is so you can get used to each other's energy and you can also get used to receiving pleasure and giving pleasure because it's not just about sex, it's about pleasure. You know, pleasure and and denying pleasure is about power. When you deny pleasure, it's like, okay, I have I have a I can resist temptation. It gives you a sense of power and it also means you can use sex as like brokerage, you know, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this with you because it gives me power over our relationship. So it gets you out of that and helps you to receive pleasure and give pleasure. I mean, if it's not going to be pleasurable, you're not going to want to go to the party. So you, you have to figure out how do we make this about pleasure for both of us in a way that can be new and intimate and exciting. And we have to relearn that in a way in your bodies and in your energy and in your hearts and in your minds and on all different kinds of levels. So without that erotic recovery, which takes time, and I, you need to have the sex date so I can give you exercises to work on during that time. Um, I find that if people do that, they can reconnect and really build a new relationship and a new monogamy. That sounds really wonderful. You said you have an ebook available on your website or something that I can link to? I do. And if people email me, I can send it to them. They can email me at Tammy at drtammynelson.com. And I'm happy to send them the ebook. I'll send it to you as well. Um, you know, and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them directly. I, mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's simple to follow and it's somewhat self-explanatory, but sometimes people get triggered and stuff comes up, which makes total sense. I mean, this is, you know, it's scary to be vulnerable after such a, um, a trauma and a betrayal, but it's, I think for many couples, it's worth it. Any thoughts as to when to put a disclaimer here for those that maybe it isn't worth it? So when there's abuse or when maybe the person who's had the affair is really not acting in ways that are going to be reconcilable so that we don't get into this trap that every single marriage has to work this out. <laughs> well, look, I think some, some affairs are what I call can openers. You know, like people have them sometimes because they really want to get out. And sometimes they do it because they don't have a voice or they don't even know they want to get out until they actually have the affair. Or they're really too chicken to do it themselves and they want their partner to do it. So if the, if the affair has been a can opener, you kind of know it because your partner doesn't want to heal. They don't want to recover. And if there's been repetitive affairs and it's almost a compulsion, usually those kind of affairs um, don't lead to healing. They just lead to uh, awareness of the dysfunctional pattern that people maybe grew up in and that they're almost like a, a compulsion to repeat something. And when that happens, you both need to take a look at what's happening and why are you with each other? What are you replaying? And, you know, if you can become conscious of it and work through it, good for you. But if not, you know, you can't really use that to bludgeon yourself over and over. And certainly, like you said, if there is abuse or um, substance abuse or d alcoholism, definitely physical abuse, people need to be safe and get out. Yeah. And, and sometimes that safety plan doesn't have to require divorce right away, but separation is usually a good idea, especially if there's physical violence. So that Absolutely. you can give yourself time to, to sort those things out. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, everyone's situation is different. And it, it certainly helps to be in therapy and to have that um, professional to help you make those decisions. Because when you're so emotionally close to it, it's really difficult to make any clear choices. Well, we are just at about an hour, which is what I had asked you for. <laughs> so appreciative of your time. I, I just want to open up any space for... Anything you'd like to finish up with? Anything I'm not asking you? Anything you'd want to make sure that you cover as far as your thoughts about infidelity and creating new monogamy contracts, etc.? Um, I, you know, I think that for anyone who is in an affair, 
if you're having an affair now and you're listening to this, ending your affair with integrity is a crucial way to um, show respect for yourself, for your partner, and for the person you're having the affair with. So I want to acknowledge that being in an affair is really painful too. I mean, no one comes back from an affair and says, oh, that sucked for me. It's usually pretty fun. But ending it is sometimes difficult and complicated. And you also many times feel awful for hurting your partner. And it can be hard to disengage. Um, the best way to do it is to show appreciation for the person that you have the affair with. Uh, thank them for everything that you've learned and uh, set a boundary saying, um, I'm going to work on my marriage and I really can't be in this relationship any longer. I'm sorry for any promises I've made you or any way that I've misled you. I appreciate everything that you've given me and for all the time that we've spent together. And if you have to see them on a regular basis, like if it's someone at work, tell them, you know, I can only have like a light and polite relationship with you. Please, I hope you understand. And that's a way to end it with integrity. It's not okay to treat someone that you've been having an affair with with disrespect by saying, I can't see you anymore. I got to go. I'm, I'm in therapy now. Because what happens is that person will be, will be so hurt and feel so disrespected that it's very likely that they will continue to disrupt your life. And it's also a sign to your partner that you don't know how to handle relationships with integrity. So you want to make sure that if you are in an affair, you end it with integrity and you make sure that your partner knows that you did that with respect and appreciation, as difficult as it may be for all three of you. If you're the person who is the other party and um, you're wondering how you can start over, um, I think that that is a whole different type of pain and a whole world of hurt. And you should really get into therapy to figure out uh, what the benefit is of being in an affair. Because part of the uh, benefit of being with a married person is that you don't have to commit. So find out why you're afraid of commitment and what you're really ready for now and get moving in your own treatment and give me a, a call or an email and I'm happy to help. And I think that's what I, what I wanted to say too, to just make sure that we acknowledge the other people. I very much appreciate that. I think that's oftentimes we leave those types of, of conversations out of these types of discussions because we're so focused on the person who's really hurt but everybody's hurting like you say everybody's hurting in these situations mm -hmm. and um any thoughts about you know i i often hear from people usually the spouse that's been betrayed will say i want you to have zero contact with this person if the person who's had an affair has some type of emotional connection and wants to continue some type of friendship or something like that What's your thoughts and ideas about the pros and cons of that? Um, I think ending a relationship with integrity really depends on what you have promised that person. So if you've been sleeping with that person every day and saying, I love you and texting every day, then sometimes stopping the sexual relationship and stopping the I love you is the beginning stage. And then slowly breaking off the, the daily contact. Um, is a better way to end it and because it's not fair to the other person. That other person has feelings too. And you, you've done that to the other person. You've created that mess. And so sometimes it is necessary to continue to text for a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. And sometimes you have to be honest with your partner about that. And you have to say, look, I really <laughs> created this fallout. And so I'm doing this and closing this exit, and this is the way I'm doing it. And because it's better to be honest about that than to be caught. So to be caught, you know, checking your phone or to be caught, you know, text messaging or emailing, to be able to say, this is the plan, and I'm slowly titrating down so that I don't hurt this person and she doesn't, you know, boil a rabbit on our front yard. Um, or that she doesn't commit suicide, or, you know, I really promised this person a lot of things, and it's, you know, I'm trying to respect that I did this. So this is the way I'm doing it slowly. 
And my commitment to you, my agreement with you is that I will be, you know, really done with this relationship for, you know, within the next month. And it's very hard for the person who's been cheated on to acknowledge that sometimes the person has to grieve. You know, who wants to watch that? Nobody. But it's difficult. Right. It can feel that that trauma that you're talking about in the sense of, so not only have you betrayed me, but now I need to watch you caretake this other person (laughs) while Mm -hmm. I'm over here having a really hard time. Yeah, that, that's really complicated. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like you're saying um, what I would probably agree with is that long-term relationships in that regard are probably not going to work. Yeah, I mean, it really depends. It depends, again, on what the vision is going forward of what you want to make happen, and it depends on how much empathy you can have for each other. And, and what on- your spouse is willing to contract you with, like if it's part of the contract or not, the new contract, yeah. Yeah, Great. exactly. Well, I think this was a fabulous discussion. You have a really wonderful way of, of talking through some of these issues, and I really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. No, thank you. So thank you for your time today. No problem. I hope people will go to my website at drtammynelson.com, and if they have any questions or problems, I'm happy to talk to them. Thank you so much for making yourself available for that. I will definitely link to all of that. Okay, fantastic. All right, you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Took the long road home, turned minutes into miles. And as the evening traveled on, the sunset bathed your smile. We stopped beneath the desert stars. Other's arms was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary Sometimes we fell apart We always came back home Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary That's 